on your channel, you yes. referenced multiple times that you are an, an agnostic as well. As an an agnostic. agnostic with an I. Is that what you're an saying? Agnostic. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So to me, I, I, I'm, I'm an anti-agnostic. Not the people, not the ones who believe it, but the concepts generally used to supposedly support it. I, I, I have a whole, I have like seven blogs, maybe five, maybe five blog posts about all the ways that agnosticism is a uh, wrong concept, you know, or how it's being presented. And so, I mean, I, I go way, way into it. Yeah, very interesting. Yes, so, I love to challenge um, any belief that I think I have. Like, oh, I get it, I understand it, and then I hear something, and I'm like, well, that doesn't fit in there. That's why the base. Yeah. Now I have to learn about it. Oh, about ignosticism? Is that what you're talking about? Oh yeah, well, ignosticism. You've probably already done it. Just like axiological atheism, a lot of people have done it because a general argument from evil, evil is kind of a, the main concept that people talk about is an axiological atheism concept. Because you're because axiology is, is the, the since the philosophy or science of understanding what is good. Beneficial, helpful, true, accurate. It's like a devaluation thing. So when you evaluate uh, atheism, what you're really evaluating is actually theism. You're evaluating, is the God concept good? And since people will kill for a concept that we know is not a real being, the concept itself is toxic. The concept itself of God, also if you think about it, God is a label. It's not a being, it's what we, like we call it king. God is the label of a thing. Because there's different kinds of gods or goddesses, or like deities. So these are labels that were like a category of leadership. So in generally when you say a god, it's a being that's able to violate human rights at will against human will. Or human rights. And to me, that's an anti-humanism concept. Because if this being really can t tell me how to live my life and rule my life or, or, or hurt me if I choose not to be a theist or hurt me if I'm gay, I mean, that concept alone makes that an anti-humanism. It should be not just something we don't believe, but something we actively reject and not reject from a hateful, but from a, a love position. Because I love humanity so much and freedom of rights of people and their dignity being status I cannot accept anything, you know, just like Sam Harris said, celestial North Korea. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. can't do it. I mean, it's just, it's, and, and I, I see it really as an anti-humanism. That's what axiology, atheism would say also. It's the exact same thing. And it's a, just a go ahead. Um, sorry. Um, and it's not just rejecting it just from like a love standpoint. It's also just, with that love standpoint, it's it's just logical. It, like, oh it's, yeah, it is totally it's, logical. It's, yes, it's all loving being. Yeah, this omnibenevolent um, thing, right. so goddamn hateful. So if you can tell us just a little bit about just what your channel is about, real quick, and then if you could take a quick turn into the evolution of religion. Okay, I think that's a really really good point to yeah. start off a, a humanist conversation. Definitely. Um, I just, just hold on. I just want to add yeah, real quick. I sent that to someone a couple months ago, months ago maybe, who is a theist. Okay. Because it's not overtly atheistic no. at all. It's just no. education, just right? And since then, this person, not an atheist, but has let go of all the magical miracle. There's still something bigger than this person, and I, I've been through all these steps. So yeah, I just yeah. think it's so fucking beautiful that it started with the evolution of religion because it made my friend go, well, then, okay. Well, That's then the point. That that, because that. obviously what I believe isn't like the all, it's just a little bit of human, yeah. So I just wanted to add that to you and why you guys who are listening should definitely go to his channel and watch it. <laughs> when you look at other religions or just the history of religion, it really pours in some like perspective in in your cup. It really, really does, and it's really neat. I'm an anti theist. You're a what? The one thing that I like an, an anti theist. Oh well, so am I. Anti theist. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But I um I thought you said an ATVist. Like, like, you know, ATVs <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we're gonna talk about <laughs> dirt bikes. <laughs> <laughs> I told you rabbit trails. Like, <laughs> but, um, no, it's the only thing I like about religion, though, is that when you look back at certain cultures, a, um, a people's religion, like a collective people's religion, can really tell you a lot about their culture, and I think that's really neat. So when you're talking about a history or an evolution of religion, I think it really does tell you a lot about the people, and that's neat. That's one thing that I do like about it. The thing that the reason I'm still an anti fist is this is so I, it's, I think it's harmful just to believe it. Um, and I'm not going to go through my whole spiel again. Yeah. Um, well, we're but on the same like, page. You know why I think it's so interesting. <laughs> so. Well, I got to this whole place in the beginning was not to actually help anybody else. I was 35 years old and in college to be a Christian drug and alcohol counselor and so I was getting my you know uh, degree in psychology and they told me that if I want to be a drug and alcohol counselor I'm gonna have to have people that believe in higher powers you know because of AA and all that shit 12-step programs so they said because of that people have different opinions of what's a higher power you know some people could be Buddhist or Muslim or whatever so they said as an ethical counselor I needed to learn about other religions uh, one class, and then I needed to take one class on the Bible. And I was so ignorant. I was actually first raised in a cult until about 13, a Christian cult. Um, that's kind of like Jehovah's Witness. So whenever I have people that know Jehovah's Witness stuff, it's like we can almost reminisce, even though it's a little bit different. Wow. Because I've lived a pretty – some of the things they did, though, were a little worse than Jehovah's Witness probably. But, I mean, they were, they were pretty uh, wild. But so then after that, I was in an evangelical Pentecostals. I was like really deep. I never questioned God in my life until 35. Never. Wow. And um, I, in fact, was so deluded. 15, I thought I was possessed by demons because I liked sex. And because <laughs> and I, I did drugs. <laughs> and because my mom told me. Demon got me too. <laughs> what's that? I said that sex demon got me too, I'm pretty sure. Damn yeah. Sex <laughs> yeah, just goddamn wanted sex. It was like weird. <laughs> Puberty hit and pull. Like biological pull. It was, yeah. yeah. So um, when when that happened, um, and then at, at later, I I believe that I was so like lucky from God because I, I almost died from liver failure because of alcoholism at 17. <laughs> And uh, I haven't drank actually since since then, since 1989, uh, January 24th, the last time I drank alcohol. Wow. So and I'm, uh, it's been you know, a lot of years, like 26 yeah. years or something. I don't know. But anyways, I, you said 1989. 1989. Oh no. January 24th. Oh, no. January 24th. Yep. That's one, exactly one month before I was born. Oh, cool. So that's how that's how long I've not like drunk alcohol. So I should tell you exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's awesome, though. That's awesome. Congrats on that. That's so, right, but I so, remember 1987. I was roller skating or something. But uh, but I, I thought that God had, like, <laughs> saved my life, and so I was so convinced God was going to do great things to me that I was in a plane one time, and the lady next to me was, like, terrified of crashing. And I said, oh, you're okay, because God's got a plan in my life. And so if the plane crashes, I'll still live. So you're next to me. You'll probably be benefited by that. I mean, I was that delusional. I was, I was like drinking Kool-Aid, making the other people drink it. I mean, I was like out there. I think you, you were double fist in the Yeah, I was. I mean, I, I, I totally. So the coronavirus, I'd probably been dead because I, I wouldn't have done anything. <laughs> I would have gone, God's got me. I'm good. But yeah, so when I, but it's important for people to understand how strong my atheism yeah. is. It didn't come from like okay. hatred. I was a I was a Christian the whole time, and then when I was in college, I took that one class, and it was the first time I couldn't have before that named five Christian sects. That I couldn't. I was I was so like, you know, focused, right. sheltered. sheltered, right. So as soon as though I took in the class in every religion, boom, 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 boom. We had to take like ten different religions, you know, one a week, whatever, and for the class and explain them. I started realizing there's a theme. All religions say that they know what the afterlife is. Just them. Not that's not like a couple of them all agree. It's like just them. They have the way you're supposed to live in this life. All of them. Just them. And it's their holy books, just theirs. I mean, almost always. 
So it's to me, I started going, whoa, 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 whoa. If they're all wrong, and mine, Christianity, is no different, I started going, whoa, maybe, maybe I'm not right. So that's the first time I started kind of doubting God, but then I took the class on the Bible, and it was a bunch of, I thought, oh, class on the Bible, I'm going to get an A. I read the Bible twice. I am, it, I live, breathe the Bible. And so, uh. <laughs> that's what I thought. Because <laughs> actually now I realize that was a little bit of ego because I wasn't actually as good in the Bible as I thought. Because as soon as they started breaking in, like, you know, uh, it was, it was a college book about the Bible. But it still turned me atheist <laughs> because it started challenging some of the things I thought I believed. And it started showing me like this book, like it's like, oh, you know how the, you know, the Gospels of Jesus started Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Well, actually, Mark was first. And I'm like, and actually, they were written before Paul. I started going, whoa, really? I mean, it just I started you know, learning things. And then, oh, yeah, you know how the Noah's Ark yeah, that's the same as the, you know, the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh practically in Babylon. And it just, I started learning this history. Like you're asking, like, how did it get to the evolution of religion? This is how. So I didn't know any atheists. Never heard an atheist. In fact, I was, a, I thought I was like one of the only few people scared that I was all alone. Didn't want my family to find out. Cause I was, I did it all on my own. No outside influence of anything. Just me looking at these facts and went, fuck. <laughs> I can't believe anymore. I mean, it was like a, I got like a head rush, like a cognitive dissonance just broke. I was like, oh, and it was right when Satan, because they showed us how a serpent, Satan, Lucifer, and the devil, not one of those are the same thing. That was it. I was just like, cognitive dissonance broke, and I was okay, Satan's bullshit. But I thought, hmm, Satan's bullshit. Fuck is God? And I thought, nothing. <laughs> it's not more any bullshit shit than the Satan. And I, I was I was right there, just done. And I was like, I don't know if I should call myself an atheist, but I'm done believing the Bible. And I'm done believing in God. And I had already took the religions, and I already felt they were wrong. And then thinking about how they're all the same and all nonsense, and I was like, I'm done with all of it. And so I became an anti-religionist right there. Because I, I, it was the first time I was informed it wasn't like hate. It was I was informed, and I saw, wow, it's all a bunch of nonsense, and people pushing nonsense that's hurting people and hating people. That's also like I have a thing where I started looking at how much sexism, because I felt like people were having this positive opinion about some religions, and I'm like, every one of them, Shintoism, Sikhism, Jainism, Buddhism, all of those, Confucianism, all those ones people think maybe those could be philosophic, every one of them have sexism. And I have blogs about all that. And it just, and, and it was that kind of like desire to learn. And I didn't really trust atheists. Fuck did I trust my whole family? They've been lying to me about this God bullshit. I was like, I didn't all of a sudden strangers that are like telling me things. I didn't trust these people. And so at first I didn't even go on Facebook, didn't talk to people because I wanted to go look. So I started looking at archaeology because I wanted, I was like, Okay, if religion is really nonsense, how did all this bullshit start? Did it just start like at 5,000 years ago or, or, you know, is it less than that? I mean, I really wanted to know. And that's actually what started me looking at archaeology and the evolution of religion, which at the time I didn't really know. I just thought, I was the beginning? <laughs> and then I started reading some stuff and I'm like, huh, this one guy said it was 100,000 years old. I was like, a hundred, it's an anthropologist. And I'm like, 100,000 years old? What the hell? He can't be right. So I started looking at other stuff. Like, how does he justify that? You know what I'm saying? I was like really going, I don't believe anything. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so I was probably in the sense more of a cynic because I just, I was dumb believing people. Fuck this. I want proof. <laughs> and that's also why I started being a rationalist. If I do not have a reason, a justified, logical, rational, evidentiary reason to think something, I try not to think it. Doesn't mean I don't, right. but I, I, so that, that started, so that's where I, I started doing more about this stuff. And I said, oh, then Gobekli Tepe, and oh, looks like, oh, so much happened, you know, about 12,000 years ago with agriculture. Maybe that's where religion was birthed. And, and then, but the more I looked, I was like, yeah, but these ideas go back 14,000 years ago. And then if you start looking, it goes back 20,000 years ago. <laughs> up in Siberia, and then you go, and he starts, uh, I started seeing, oh, and then I started realizing what these people were doing. 
wow, they're doing shamanism. And I, I had this amazing thing. All the burials of shamans were female. Blew my freaking mind. Then I started looking, and even in North Korea, I think it was 1,200 years ago, they had to make a new word because the word for shamanism they had only meant female. So they had to make a word, and they took the word for female, made it male, and they used the new word and gave it to females, almost like, oh, you were the app, the, the rib, you know, you're the rib. Right. <laughs> but it really was always female. Blew my mind. That was, I felt like, wow, religion is a scam. I did not, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that at all. Yeah, because it's, it, yeah. dude, because I, I was like, I, it blew, it blew my mind. I mean, I, it's like I realized, yeah. wow. I I don't know religion. <laughs> From the time you start like started this when you, when you started questioning things to the point you're at right now, how how long was that? I've well, I've been doing it since basically 2006. Okay. So yeah, I've been yeah. and I I went out like, all at once. Yeah. So I yeah I did I couldn't have actually got it all at once because like like this is what I tell people. Now, because I've done so much research, when I talk, some people are like, man, that almost sounds like, you know, you're, you're saying stuff like ancient aliens. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, yeah. it doesn't make sense until you read like five or ten of my blogs, and then you start going, oh, I see why you think this. At least, even if you still didn't agree, you, you would understand, okay, I guess I can't say that's not, you know, reasonable. The ancient alien stuff is absolute, you know, nonsense. And the stuff they yeah. say is inaccurate. Or sometimes they skew the facts and say things in ways that are not, or they only show like half a picture and they don't explain the whole concept. One person said before that the Egyptian stuff and the stuff in the Mayans is very similar. Well, to me, one of the reasons that could be is they have similar, in a sense, shamanism cultures that they started from. There's certain like belief sets. What's really interesting too is if you look at shaman drums in America and you look at shaman drums in Siberia, you almost cannot tell the difference. I mean, they, they start actually in Siberia and go over the Americas in the whole time they went over, they were already shamans. This one guy wrote a book and he tried to say that shamanism was in a sense invented in America 14,000 years ago. And then it went back into, you know, um, over into Asia and stuff. But I said, really? I, I talked to this archaeologist I'm on, link, on LinkedIn. And I said, really? Because you do see that there's these burials that happen um, with the Graviton culture in Sinclair, Russia. And they are, I think it's 34 to 36,000 years old. And they're already doing, they, they're wearing clothes with beads and stuff that looks like Native Americans. I mean, it looks exactly like that same, and there's, there's something like, yeah, the hats, and there's something like, I think, um, 1500 carved beads, ivory beads. So they, that's, that's time consuming. That means it meant something. Oh, totally. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and what, to, to me, what it might mean is it has to do with the ancestors and the stars. Because in a sense, a lot of the cultures would have stars as the gods or the place of the ancestors. Like What's that? What else was there? Oh, yeah, exactly. At night, that's what there was. Exactly. So like you said, how I explain it, I try to explain like religion, the evolution of religion, even though I'm an atheist and anti-theist and anti-religionist, I try to explain it in a sense from an anthropological sort of perspective that look at this thing, just like I would look at the Greek mythology. I wouldn't sit there at Greek mythology and keep going, yeah, God's bullshit. <laughs> you know, I would just say that they they believe this, they believe this, and you know, you know and when, but the whole point of why I do the, the, I wanted to then turn it into a series and then I actually have a book about it, the evolution of religion that I'm working on to publish. I'm going to have probably like 4,000 references. <laughs> I have to have a side book just for the references. But, um, is basically, I want people to see the humanness of religion. Remove all the superstitious bullshit. When you see these, here they are. It's like people are like, oh, well, we're not pagan. Yeah, you are. You're just a branch of paganism to me. I mean, the world <laughs> religions today. Okay. And you guys do fire worship with the candles, water worship with baptism. You know, it's like you have all you these. You put mistletoe in your house at Christmas. That it's, is very pagan. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really hilarious that 
they think it's but what's interesting too is that like, like i argue with someone about paganism because he's like well that's not what a pagan is or they didn't start there and i'm like oh so you have in a sense a definition of paganism because paganism was a, was a slur from christians it was like a non-christian you're out in the wilderness and stupid you're out you know <laughs> Blood and yeah, so that's, that's right. so it's not not like at the time people would say I'm a Roman pagan. They didn't, you know. We now call it that. It's like like, like people don't realize Gobekli Tepe. That's not what those people called it. Who knows what they called it? You know, that's what people nowadays called it. Yeah. I do for all that the, the ancient alien bullcrap. Uh, for anyone who's listening right now, we have. We have friends, actually, in our community, um, Megan and Dr. Josh, who run a channel called Digital Hammurabi, and they read and teach ancient Sumerian. Cool. They're just the sweetest humanists, the, the two of them, and they're free children. Super cute I adore them. Matt, uh, Brant, I asked him to link it in the chat, so he did. So anyone who wants to check them out, please do. And they have a scholarship fund for students who actually want to go into what they're doing. And what they're doing is a lot like what you do, just on a uh, a professor level. Yeah. They teach how we know what we know about this ancient. You know, there's there's doesn't go as far as like all that you do. They <laughs> they stick in this one so that they're experts in it, and they can they teach how to read ancient Sumerians. It just blows my mind that in 2020 there are actively active people that can just pick up a tablet or go online and look at tablets in a museum and read it. Like I just, I'm like, what? <laughs> I love that. I think that the more I learn, the more I see that I know nothing. <laughs> I need more and more and more and more. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, well that's also one of the reasons why I decided to do it because no one else, in a sense, is doing what I'm what I'm doing. That what archaeologists, that even if there was ones that knew everything I know, they would probably not be as as open to do it because it would shame religion, and they're not going to do it. There's a bunch of reasons. One reason is they got to go do digs, so you're not going to go do a dig if you're in a country where they, somebody could capture and kill you because they realize that you've made fun of or they you know put down their religion in some way. So I was at my uh, show with History Voyagers that I just started and did started my one one show for the 10 shows I'm going to do on Gobekli Tepe. <laughs> and so, I really want to explain what it really is so people will stop believing such nonsense about it. Started getting, you know, this uh, realization of what's there. I wanted to give it to everybody else. So that was my uh, in a sense desire to be educational. And I wanted to with the same thing that kind of happened to me in college. That once I read the archaeology and saw how well it disproves, in a sense, the religious that I, the you know, ideas I believed in, that I hope that it does the same thing to other people. That it makes them go, I need to question my religion. I need to, I need to, you know, stop believing it. And so that that's that's a massive goal of mine, you know, because I, I I feel like I trust people's reason. I feel like some people go, you can't reason with people. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I have a psychology degree. We actually are taught to reason with very unreasonable people some people that have massive mental disorders who cannot even use reason and you still have to make them reason so i i, I just feel it's it's hard if you say it's hard and you and or the obviously even mental health therapy can't reach every single person in a hundred percent way but aren't we also for harm reduction I mean, so let's say us as an atheist, we don't ever cure the world, you know, of religion and, and it stays because I think that's a, a highly likely possibility, you know. So that's also why I'm a humanist is that to me, if we are, you know, not able to give it atheism, then we still have to do something positive in the world. And so the most positive thing is to get everybody on the same page that religion or no religion, we all need to care that religion or no religion atheism or theism we need to see that we rise as a humanity you know by helping each other and you know if, if we start doing that and so i feel like also like you said that my video series on history is, is more approachable to people because i feel like and i've said this before you can't punch people in the face with the truth and expect them to listen so you <laughs> So I, what I feel is you have to give it to them like an adult. You give it to them like a present they can unwrap for themselves. And 
And you, and you, instead of, you know, uh, saying to them, you know, I don't think you're getting it, it's to say, I know you can get it. It's to start believing in their ability. And I've done that before where I tell people, like there's one video I have where I was uh, challenged by a apologetic school. And there's like seven people that, that challenged me for three hours. And this one guy was, I, I did good with all of them. But uh, this one guy, I, I like whooped him so bad, like logically and humanistically. It's not even funny. And I even told him, you disgust me. I said that in the video. And he's like, well, because he, he were talking about slavery. And he's and I said, you would you would, you support the selling of your daughter. And he's like, well, if you were poor and I go, dude, you disgust me. I mean, the guy is yeah. just yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. Dude. So, so, something that like really strikes me is like, OK, well, I can't trust you as if you try to say that humanism is just an immoral like stance. Because like if you just look at the basics, like the basis of humanism, you can see that like, it has all good intentions. There's nothing wrong with it. It just lacks a God. So it's just like if you open your mind just just a teeny, teeny bit. It lacks um, authority. You, you, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it lacks authority, but it adds responsibility. There's nothing immoral right. about that. Right. Right? But you can't really call it immoral. It's just That just makes you untrustworthy <laughs> if you're going to say that it's immoral. Um, you could say that you think it's wrong or that you don't think it's good enough because it doesn't have a God. I'd be like, well, I also disagree, but you know, you do you. But if you just think it's just immoral or it's an awful evil thing, it's just like you are either just willfully, willfully ignorant, or you're just you're just not a tr trustworthy, honest person. Yes, I find that the, the woefully ignorant is a massive amount of our fellow brothers and sisters here in America. And because I am a humanist first. <laughs> I have been able to recently, too. It's been really hard. Like I told you, I learned that the hard way of you can't punch people with facts. I lost my best friend of 20 years to the yeah. Jehovah Witnesses because I tried to punch her in the face with facts. Yeah. Documents, research, I did all, I'm doing all the work. All you have to do is read it. You know, can't believe you don't believe this stuff and you're so stupid. You're an idiot. You know, yeah, I lost it. Yeah, I think, it's, so like I said, I, it about like, yeah. the same thing. I don't think it's any different than how I said. You should treat trans people, you know, under not understanding, you know, their, their um, you know, pronoun. It's compassion. So how should we treat the religious? Compassion. We sh these people are deluded. We need to give them compassion. And that doesn't mean we don't hold them accountable for their bad behavior, but or or you know, bad things. But like I have a, I have a, a blog with a uh, post where this one guy started by telling me to go fuck myself because I'm an atheist. Oh. And I, I asked him, why do I deserve for you to say that? And, it, and by, by the end, I, talk, I, I talked all kinds of atheist stuff. And, but, but I was, I was making him own up to what he's doing. Is that credible behavior? Is it, it, you know, prove that I deserve for you to say this to me. And it ends up that, it, to the end of talking to him, that he said, you know, I apologize. And I didn't even ask him to. He said, I want to apologize. I was wrong. And I never should have said that to you. You're actually a cool guy. You just want to have things you can prove. I understand that. I, I'm telling you, I think that I probably did more for that guy, you know, not just for me, but for viewing atheism and probably viewing his own beliefs. Because here he had been so toxic, and I didn't yeah, respond in obviously. kind. Wow. Yeah. And that's I a skill. That's kindness goes a long, kindness goes a long way. Uh, yeah. I, I think kindness and, and to me, it, it, you know, I, I want my humanity to be, you know, like poetry flowing through me. That it's just who I am and it's a beautiful thing to look at. That what it's not something that I try to do. It's just something who I am. And so, that, like I said, you know, before, it's about being, you know, seeing others as, as dignity beings. You know, and uh, as far as going back to the religion, it's the same thing. You know, looking at the evolution of religion, instead of having my anti-religious, you know, anti-theist, you know, perspective, I try to look at the past. And these were people that were ignorant. They were uninformed. But one of the sad things I see is maybe religion started in wonder, but it ended in closed mindedness, which is the opposite of wonder. It's the opposite of trying to figure it out. 
religion started, I think, with maybe, you know, people trying to, does this work, does that work? When you don't really know, you don't have science, you know, I can see where it's more, you get be more forgiving that they, they weren't trying to, at a certain point, though, they didn't care. They used religion. And I, I feel like, especially about 5,000 years ago, religion gets a military, you know, in, in a sense for a whole country with Egypt. You know, before that, in some of the Sumerian, you know, city states, you had religion to a city, like a goddess that would, you know, the king, in a sense, would be connected to because it's a king priest, just like the pharaoh was, in a sense, a king priest. And so the religious thing, they like say separated of church and religion. Yeah, that needed to happen back in 5,000 years ago because basically church and religion was the same thing. And guess what? Life sucked and it was massively hierarchical. And, you know, they were at the top and then the people that were the, you know, priests were at the next. And then, then, then you have the, like the rich people and then you have the military. Then you have the people, you know, that are the normal. Then you had slaves, the lowest of garbage to, to those people. And it just, yeah, but you know, it's yeah, but no, you, right. you just see that, right. the, like I said, so to me, really, once religion got a military, and then also right. another thing happened, it went from a belief system to a thing of a country. So in other words, you all in Egypt have to, in a sense, believe these kind of things, and then Mesopotamia, well, Arabia. yeah, it starts to do those, and that I don't care if you you didn't you know know that kind of mentality. How would you know who believes what? You've made it mandatory. You know, it's like it's like someone looking out and going, well, I think everybody here is heterosexual. Well, if you've never asked anybody, how the hell do you know? You know, it's like already assuming we, we already have to assume it. But what's that? Republic, um, Armin, Armin Navabi. Yeah. His, his Atheist Republic yeah. um, podcast has been downloaded like nearly, uh, I, last time I looked, I remember I was just like, wait, how many times? Hundreds of thousands of times, if not millions of times, in Saudi Arabia. What? <laughs> but they have to. They have thumb drives. They can't watch it. They have right. to pass around thumb drives. So I, I just thought crimes are. Um, that's what to me. You know, there are at the worst religions and at the best religions. At the worst are thought crimes. You can get your head chopped off for thinking something. Yeah, and that's the worst kind of authoritarianism. Um, and you really find that worst kind of authoritarianism in theist thinking. Theist thinking. So can you give us, I don't know, five to ten examples off the top of your head of some of like the archaeological things? Oh, that, sure. I know what you mean. So I'll give you a rundown. Research down to, down to the about 5,000 years ago thing, so we can get back into the authoritarian... Yeah. Yeah, of it, and no problem. Switch to our next topic, which is that. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, to me, uh, animism and pre-animism. So I think pre-animism is like kind of, and before that, I think it was superstition was growing because of the behaviors of how they did things. Even like stone tools, they started to do stone tools in only certain types. Why? Who the fuck is like looking at it? It's like you're showing off. I mean, I mean, why? why I just, it's, 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 they're, they're overdone. Like when they start, and this is about a million years, I think, um, they start looking, because they, they actually, the oldest stone tools is about 3.4 million years old. There's uh, cut marks on bone that shows they don't have the stone tool. The stone tool is, is that they have is a little bit younger, not much. It's 3.3 million years old. That's when stone tools, and it start, that's, that's actually pre-homo erectus. That, that also to me is interesting because we look at the Australopithecus, Paranthus, Boise, and we, we think, oh, these things were not even close to human. Well, maybe not close to human. It shouldn't be thinking them as like, you know, apes. <laughs> you know, they, they, these people were, 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 were people. They were, you know, they were very arcane, but in a sense, they, they already had, you know, not just walking upright, you know, but the use of tools and then a, a type of, you know, creativity that was emerging and to me i see that as like it's it's starting it's this obsessiveness with doing stuff because i find a lot of the religion is almost like obsessive compulsive you get into doing these little behaviors and always have to do these little behaviors so it's it's, it's kind of like a psychological thing but you start to see that happening where even you see it in the, in the archaeological record of stone tools so then uh, in uh, Paranthus Boise, um, before, like, is the earliest type of a strange 
uh, I don't know what to call it, burial or placement of bodies where they put um, this whole like troop of them. I think it's uh, top of my head, like 17 or 21 or something. Did you say 28 by chance? 28 maybe? Is that right it is? You're correcting I me? Like I heard that yesterday. <laughs> oh, I haven't thought about it in a long time. So. Today. Oh. I feel like I heard you say that today. Oh, I may have. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, but anyway, so they arranged the bodies in like a circle. And I, and I, why? I mean, so, it, it, but to me, but all I was going to say is to me, that's the, it's the starting of this symbolism. Like the starting of thinking about doing things abstractly to the bodies and that people kind of maybe mean something. Like they're not just to, stuff to just leave to animals to eat without any, any thought. So, and then at 250 in Rising Star Cave is Homo Naladi that actually there's two cave chambers where they laid bodies. They're like deep in the, in the, the, the chambers. And to me, that's like an early cemetery. And they're doing this deliberate behavior. And this is pre-anism. This isn't, to me, religion. It's just, because even anism begins kind of almost not religion. But it, it starts this religious type of thinking. And animism is, is nothing amazing. Because animism is something that children do. All of us until about seven have this type of magical animistic thinking about the world. We're not, we, we look at stuff and it, if it, something moves, we automatically think of agency, you know, or a doll. Uh, you could even like to talk about in psychology that, uh, uh, say, if you look at a teddy bear and you have these warm feelings that are towards a, a being, or you talk and think about it like a being, that's, that's a form of animism. And so you can see where that's really quick to just become superstitious thinking and then supernatural thinking and then, you know, spirits and then from there, you know, all kinds of religious concepts. And so pre-anism, they start to do these behaviors around death. So I see the fear of death as probably something that, you know, um, made people start to, to get this religious type of concepts that, that give meaning to later religion. So the, the, after the home and laddie, then you have, um, you know, Neanderthals are the ones that did the first burial. They were taking eagle claws and wearing them probably as a necklace at 160,000 years ago, somewhere around there. And then at 130, there's evidence of uh, Neanderthal burials. So they buried bodies before in the ground before us. Or they also put bodies in like cemetery type, of, like the home and laddie did, where they put them like in a chamber, and then they put like stuff around them that could be kind of sacred. But at 175,002, there's a um, three stone rings that are made of these stalactites the Neanderthals did. So it's kind of like a chapel or something. It's some kind of a, a meaning to it. And then at 120, I think it's possible we were also, in a sense, up in by 100,000 up in uh, Israel. And so in Israel, the um, Neanderthals started burying in the same place that we were we were at. So they've already been doing this for thousands of years. And then we end up in the same area they were already at burying. And then we start burying, or not we, but the arcane humans <laughs> started burying, and they did it in a way that looked very Neanderthal. And they also used Neanderthal-style tools that uh, uh, experimental archaeology has said takes at least three days from someone teaching you to even pick up to do it because it's so hard. Different though, that the Neanderthals did it fatter because they have different size hands. And since ours were a little bit longer, a little bit different shaped because of our different hands. And so to me, this is a really interesting thing because not only did we pick up their behaviors, we, we certainly picked up um, burying people using red ochre on the burial and putting the same type of tools Neanderthals have been doing, uh, I think, almost for, I think it's almost 200,000 years or something, just these type of stone tools, somewhere right there. Maybe it's 180. can't remember exactly. But anyways, but wait, wait for us, because we didn't even go near them until about 100,000. In fact, 100,000 uh, up in Siberia is probably the first uh, humans going out of Africa and mating with Neanderthals for the first time. Interesting is, when we, when we went out the first time, it was female human with a Neanderthal male. But when we come back at about 50,000 years, 40,000 years, it's actually human males mating with Neanderthal females. So it switches. But there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff to me of why that possibly is too. Neanderthals are not very social as compared to humans were. Humans are like 50, you know, 
people or it could be up to 300 people. Neanderthals are generally um, smaller, you know, little things and they do, they kind of interact even far distances. They were more like seven, eight people, 15 people, one little family, maybe a little sort of a nucleus or something, seven, six people. So it's much easier to see why if a whole bunch of humans come someplace, who's going to get yeah. the females? I mean, it's, it's really interesting. What's that? And then we were off to the races. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, they were off to the rapeses. But yeah, so. Rapes. It's not funny, but. It no, it's not funny, but, but. But yeah, so. It was funny. It was funny. No, because we can think that they were good Neanderthal women that loved these new humans. I doubt it. So. So, because I'm living reality. So, and, and, and that's what some of the, the stuff uh, I uh, hypothesize are logical jumps. I mean, obviously, if this happens, you know, who, what, who's doing what, you can, you know, kind of figure, well, what would have happened? How would that have occurred? And when you realize these are just fellow humans, you, can, you know, or a type of human, you can go, okay, then they probably acted a lot like us. Although we've, we've changed a few times in our brain from 300,000 to 100,000 you know, to basically 10,000 years ago. But after 10,000 years, all of us are, in a sense, sort of the same. But about the, the religion, so once the, we, we start burying, then those people, it starts getting cold. They're cold front. And the people that were there in uh, Israel went back to Africa. Not all of them. Some of them were obviously buried, and some probably went more north or went to Asia. But they, a lot of them came back. So they come back to um, probably Eastern Africa, Northeast Africa, whatever over there. And then from there, though, everybody by 75,000 in Africa, all humans, in a sense, that live today, the, our ancestors all went to South Africa. This is very important because about 75 to 70,000 years ago, you get a burial that looks like the one way up in Israel. <laughs> it's a burial of a kid with, with like a like Neanderthal. It is, um, they have red ochre on it and it's buried with a conch shell and it's buried with other, you know, uh, like trinkets. So it must have had like a necklace or something else and was buried. And you also have the emergence of the first documented worship, 70,000 to 75,000 year old stone snake in a cave. And so they, they actually were burning, they would, they would bring stone tools from far around, all different kinds of, of uh, stone too. And they would be perfectly made, and they would burn them under the snake. So they would do a sacrifice, which we've definitely, you know, still see people in a sense sacrificing for what they believe today. It's, you know, it's this, it's, it's a very old animistic belief, I believe. And so everybody then goes from there, say, over to um, even Australia. They start with this African type animism that they kind of picked up from the Neanderthals in to me which, like I said, I know they buried it. I just think that how else were they to get in these ideas? They go to the same place someone else is doing something, and all of a sudden you come back and you look like them? I don't know. <laughs> how is that not they taught you <laughs> in some way? But so also you have over in Australia, the first earliest burials in Australia look exactly like the ones in Africa. So it helped me understand, you know, these are at 40-something thousand. So it helped me understand that if you look at that, you know that these are... So when they came over, they just didn't come, and then later they made religion. They did later make religions, but they started with this stuff that already. It already had been a sense... They could, but if you think about it, we think of today as religion and culture separate. Back then, the, stop thinking that. There is no such thing. Just like to an animist... Because I've watched a lot of stuff on, on, on how they are. Because it's important not for me to understand. I don't want to straw man them. I want to know what do they kind of think or believe. And so I've watched things of animus and totemus out in you know, their environment. And it's so funny that how they see the world, there's no such thing in animus as sacred and profane. Everything is sacred. It sounds a lot like when people say I'm spiritual, not religious, man. You know, yeah, 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 when they, because yeah. they, they, they're like, yeah, God there's, love, everything's man. alive and, you know, you just work with everything and it'll all be God cool. In, in a I'm sense. I mean, there's, <laughs> I'm making, I'm making fun about it, but, <laughs> but, but, but in a sense, it's I kind of. I think I probably have said, meaning it, like I knew what the hell I was talking about, that God is that. Yeah. I'm positive. So, so that's fine. So, so animism does this. But one thing that they, I realized too by understanding animists is because they see nature as such a part of a balance, 
they're not really about evil the way that later religions are about evil. To them, evil is like, in a sense, that is, is a weird concept. Because them, there's the good things that happen and bad things that happen. And you just kind of, you try to do the right thing so you don't have any, like, negative energy. <laughs> Or negative spirits or whatever. So, but what's really interesting is that to them, their level of uh, respect for nature is super high. Just like in how they relate to it. Like there's a, a video that shows um, three animists in Africa, right? With like almost no clothes on and like, like just a pole walking up to lions in the wild, wild lions that had just killed an animal and they go and they steal its food. I mean, it's the most shockingly bizarre, and I couldn't even imagine it. It makes the guy that plays with alligators look like he's, you know, just a beginner. I mean, you go up to three lions and go to take their food. You're braver than me. I wouldn't do that with a machine gun. But, but, but if you notice what they do, they've said these lions kind of know because they get them when they're, they're younger, but they also... It's how they take the food. They walk up slowly. They don't threaten it, do anything, don't throw anything at it. They just kind of like say, we're going to come. The lions leave. They take like a leg, leave the rest. And the guy says, why don't you take it all? They left. And he goes, because I want to take it again tomorrow. And the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. They know that I will leave them their food. I only take some. He goes, and and I was just like, this that remind me when people say, well, animus or religion started because of fear of lightning. I'm like, you've never met an animus or seen something about animus because I'm telling you that is wrong. If animism is, which I do think most anthropologies and archaeologists kind of agree that animism is the first sort of religion, then it can't be because of that. I do think it was fear of death because that has to do with spirits. The, the belief of death is a belief in afterlife. And, the, and also that goes to the ancestor worship of that if everyone dies and they're still alive, that they are, are could either help or hurt me. And so I, I, you know, in a sense, worshiping the ancestors is basically showing them respect. Don't don't hurt me or make, you know, make sure if you can't talk to the bad people up there on my behalf. It's it's just different. It's still wrong. <laughs> I mean, at least they're <laughs> well, true. They, they but I, knew them, and they were here, and now they're not. And without any science, no scientific math, no nothing, you know that they were here, that they were conscious beings. That you had these great conversations, however you spoke at that time, and now they're not. Well, that couldn't just in our monkey minds. I can't just disappear. Yeah. You have to be someone else. Yeah, you know? it's it, it's, our, it's our it's our. It, it's our belief that we're that important. It's we, we feel like the right. world matters to us. It, but the world matters to me. There has to be that I have a purpose because I matter to me. Well, duh. You matter to you. That's what a dog thinks. So does they go to heaven Whatever too? Whatever purpose you want. Whatever purpose you want. <laughs> right. The, um, the massive universe. Well, let me, let me try to, to, to – now I've, I've, been, I've been doing it too slow. Let me go a little fast. Try to go a little faster. So – uh, then at about forty uh, three thousand to almost fifty thousand, you have this uh, uh, new thing where they're making um, a female naked female figure that hangs around the neck or or hangs somewhere because there's no head and the head is a hole where you could hang it on something. So they start and there's two of them carved, almost the same exact thing. I don't think that to me personally that has anything with goddesses at that point. I, I people like look at every fe- uh, female figure and are like, oh, it's goddess. I'm like, I don't know why they're doing that. I mean, <laughs> what is wrong with you people? You know, I'm not saying at some point there wasn't goddesses, but come on. I mean, everything that's a female is not automatically. And to me, also, um, I don't see to- but Yeah, and I don't see totemism as, uh, which I think this is like the emergence of totemism for not just that one artifact, but or type of artifact that started, but also because of there's a new behavior. At four, DNA tells us that about forty thousand years ago. Incest drops dramatically. Now, if you have a bunch of guys that can rape whatever they want, what possible reason besides some new moral standard, you know, that are in, is being enforced is, is all of a sudden incest stopping? I mean, it just, you can't hardly get people to not, you know, molest people now. 
You know, could you imagine when there's no rules and there's no government and there's, I mean, come on. So it yeah. tells me that by 40,000 years ago, and I say, I think it's 50 where, where there's totemism because totemism has a sacred and profane, something that the animists don't think. And the sacred and profane is the same thing that we have with the sacred in general. Like this land is sacred. The, the fact that land could be something is an animistic thinking. The totemism is the fact of making this the concept or place mean this kind of stuff. So to me, totem is like, is like, animism is like the belief in spirits. Totemism is like the belief that spirits can be in a sense connected in some way or related to in little figures or in concepts. And it also has the concept of the sacred and profane because how could this little, you know, artifact be sacred unless there's something called sacred? Which means some things are not sacred. And you also start having things like taboos, which is like the not having sex with your, you know, uh, relatives. <laughs> which you start, and then, uh, um, there's an atheist, um, I can't remember his name, but he's a, a professor, I think at Harvard, but I can't remember exactly right now, but he's an amazing speaker. And he's a hardcore atheist. He talks about evolution and stuff. And he says that um, this agrees with my concept that it's about 40,000 to 45,000 years ago that we started learning moral behaviors. He's an evolutionary psychologist, I believe, it, which is the same thing archaeologically and DNA. I'm finding. So he thinks that from his, his sort of stuff, like checking the behavior. I also see it in the DNA. But anyways, so I'll go on. So then about uh, 30,000 years ago, you have uh, shamanism which to me is almost a throwback to animism. This sort of a, okay, maybe we went too extreme with this totemism shit and the sacred and profane. <laughs> maybe we just need to chill out a little bit. It's almost like, you know, the guys smoking drugs, which the shamans definitely did drugs. And they have that more, uh, and I'm not saying that in a, like being mean to, to you know, people doing drugs, but they started having a, a little bit different, like the uh, totemists are a lot more hardcore and, and and how they do things and the more in a sense male structured, I would say, like do this, do that, a lot of laws and, you know, top down authority where shamanism is, like I said, uh, the oldest ones, there's one at, I think it's 26,000 years old or 28,000 years old in uh, the Czech Republic. And it's uh, the first in a sense known shaman burial of a female. From there, shamanism is buried even at um, Israel at 12,000 years ago, there's a female shaman buried in Israel. And 12,000 years ago is like about the time of the agricultural revolution. And I think that's what kind of spawns to me turning shamanism into paganism. In a sense, these people are hunter-gatherer shamans and they start getting, you know, the first thing is like a Gobekli Tepe, they find alcohol at 11,000 years ago. They, there's a thought that, you know, that's, you know, alcohol itself, beer, is what they probably made, some kind of a grog, but that that, you know, spawned this whole, you know, new uh, desire to, to be the agricultural revolution because all of a sudden, wow, these grains are some good, you know, good stuff to get high on. <laughs> and, uh, they, and alcohol probably for a long time was religious based. Even like later on, there was a lot of like what they called, you know, witches or whatever, were actually women brewing alcohol, like brewing beer. It, it's really interesting to me, uh, like I said, going to be about the sexism, but how much different religion before a certain time even approach women. Because like if you get before with the city states about 5,000 years ago, you get the fact that the city-states are basically justifying their religion authority or their kingship authority on a goddess, generally, not so much always a god. And it's really, to me, that male type of thinking happens with Egypt, because Egypt, when it makes this emperor, king, you know, pharaoh, it basically says only can pass through the male line. They didn't really kind of say that as much before. You know, as far as um, the focus, they made it like a law, <laughs> sort of like this is the way it has to. What I think, though, is still interesting about transgender and stuff is women could be a pharaoh as long as she wore a beard, like a fake beard. So if you presented yourself as male to an Egyptian, you know, that's, I guess they're seeing it, you are a male. If you present as male, you're a male. And what's interesting, too, is that... that there's a lot of belief in uh, too much heteronormativity when when people that are even archaeologists look at the past because they start with this, you know, colored mindset. Everyone's heterosexual. 
all throughout time, which is complete fucking nonsense. There's like the, like, like, do you know the oldest intersex figure is like 22,000 years ago? So, I mean, they, they were, in, <laughs> they already knew about it. So it, it's really funny that, you know, the later people act like, you know, well, now I'm supposed to accept this new thing. Yeah, that new thing, it's only been around for thousands of years. <laughs> and so, it's, it's like there's a burial, uh, I think it's of uh, about, let's say 2,000 years ago or 3,000. They thought it was a female, like a princess. And then they found out it was a guy, but he was dressed as a female. And they're like, I remember the archaeologists, they don't say anything about trans. They just go, well, that was really odd that he dressed that way. And I was like, yeah, because maybe he was gay or maybe he was trans or maybe he was just cross-dressing. Right. <laughs> but, a lot of things. Could would have been all normal for well, them. And, you know. A lot of people don't realize, even talking about what's normal, is that the European concept in before about about 4,000, I think it's 500 or 4,000 years ago, there was, I think, four or five genders. It's only after that when all of a sudden they're like, okay, more male dominant stuff happens. And I, like, do you know that the oldest, um, Rimmons write sort of a document is like 4,000 years old from southern Turkey. It was a treaty between them and Mesopotamia. Hey, our women matter. We need to respect them. Don't, don't hurt them. Or, or I can't remember exactly, but really, it's a, really, it's really like to see that. Like I would want, I, I need to read that. Oh yeah. I have a blog on it. Sure that was Christy and then Christy shared it with me. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I have a blog on that because I, because it just, all this matters to me. And like I said too, yes. the, but I was saying too is that, What's that? So please share it with us. Like a, oh, yeah. Just link us to oh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you the I, – I, I have a blog on it. Like I said, the, the more – I told you, the more I started learning stuff, the more I realized there's a lot of shit we don't know, man. This is what I've tried to understand, too. It's like the fact that there was a time when there wasn't racism. There was ethnocentrism, but it wasn't what we what we think of as racism. And there was a time, too – Like a week ago. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, and there's a time, too, when there wasn't any or not as much, because certain cultures still could have been, but there was a, a, a lot that were not that sexist. They were more equalitarian, and they basically changed. And our cultural religion started to make people own land. When you own land, then you pass it down to your children. That's a behavior that didn't, in a sense, ever happen before. Who the hell own land? The land is the land. You just walk around. You know, if you need something, you take it. I mean, so it cha- that also made war. War happens, the first sign of war is about 13,000 years ago in Africa. It's probably a fight over water, but they murdered these whole, like, seven people or something like that. I think it's that many. Then you have another, really, war in the Middle East starts about 10,000 years ago. But the, the saddest thing, really, is that it's almost 5,000 years that we've had nonstop war somewhere in the world. It's It's just, it's sad. Humanity, you know... For trying to do better, you know, we, we've seen to you know, also, but then again, how much, because is religion somehow, even if not in the forefront of what's going on in the background, because in a sense to me, it's the religious or concept of sacred. Like people think about now, like this is my country and somehow just like I, I remind me, I, I went to Mexico, right? I was living in California and I went down to Mexico to help out in an orphanage down there because they're fucking in need. They don't even have a system. It was like, you know, there's people helping because the government really doesn't do much. And so I, I wanted to help kids that have nothing. When I told one of my atheist friends about it, he goes, why are you going back to Mexico? I'm like, yeah, like some stupid line. They're only like, I think it was 60 miles away or 80 miles away from me where I went. But yet we're supposed to care about New York and it's like 3,500 miles away. And That's I'm supposed funny, isn't it? Um, and then, so I said, and to think that these humans that are just 60 miles away do not matter, it blows my mind. I, I, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, this is something that, like, as authoritarianism, like, as much as I hate that, I also hate tribalism of any sort, right? Like, including nationalism. Oh, can't stand nationalism. nationalism. Um, and that's another reason why I do like humanism. Because it's so goddamn inclusive. Yes. It's so borders are just you know something that we draw. It's that's right, and they've changed right? a lot. If you start looking at history, look, look at a map and see how much the borders have changed. It's a joke. Yeah. 
If the people, yeah. and, and like I said to me, it's really a joke too, because you realize everyone came from Africa. Like I said, we all started out as animists. I mean, that's what our, all of our ancestors are like. Well, my ancestors believe in Muhammad. Well, actually, if you're going to get down to all of our ancestors, they were animists, probably. So let's just cut all the yeah. bullshit. You know? Because, yeah. <laughs> and how about no, this? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You just proved my point. So, <laughs> about a week ago, my girlfriend and I, we yeah. were talking, and I, okay, so smart people, people who want actual humanist policies, right? Um, people who support an egalitarian future are what I call the, well, actually, people. <laughs> 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 and you just said, well, actually. Yeah. Like, yes. 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 <laughs> that might be have... true to you and what you know so far. But actually. Yeah. But let actually. me tell you. I'm like, but actually, that's not true. Let me tell you the real truth. And or, 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 or it just like, like when they go, you know, I don't understand this gender thing. I'm like, well, let me break it down for you, okay? Everyone starts as a female. Done. Let's start with that. So you at one time were a female. Everyone was. Because everyone had an X. And an X is all you need to be a female. In a sense, a male is a deformed female. In fact, to be more accurate, what, 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 to be more accurate, <laughs> well, I'm saying, to, to be more accurate, if you don't do anything, you end up with a female because that's the default. But a male has to have three things happen. Anti-feminizing androgens, removing the feminine, and then has to have masculizing androgens, got to turn you into man, and then you got to throw in the testosterone to help all that out. And so if you don't have any of that process gets, gets uh, not done correctly, well, guess what? You know what you have? Something not male. Not exactly always it means up female. But uh, not exactly the archetype of what is only male. Another thing people don't realize, too, is you can have an X and a Y makes a male. But they don't realize, not even talking about transgender, I'm talking about actual fact. There are a few intersex women that everything, they have a vagina, everything looks like a woman. They're born, but they're XY, so genetically, you should call them a man. And then there's some men that are XX, and usually an XX equals a woman what we consider so the, the whole part of this like they go well i believe in the dna and I'm, uh, biology and i'm like oh great i'm so glad so you must support trans rights then I, you can't possibly not right. oh my right. God. so infuriating because they just need to facts facts that right. this happens to biology and horses and cows and pigs and fish and humans, it happens when things grow. It's what happens. Some flowers yeah. grow. We well, weird stuff. So if that happens, why can't you say, why can't you admit that that can happen inside here, too? Yeah, well, it's... Right. Because, like... But I think it is, it's, it's a lot of fear. Yeah, it is. It it's is. a lot of fear because I don't want to have to, to accept something I don't like. I don't want to have to understand yeah. something I don't want to understand. Like it. Yeah, it's like, I don't... Sure. I don't want to do that. Well, there's a lot of things I don't want to do that people do. I mean, some people enjoy being a human toilet. Yeah, I've seen that, and boy, I don't I want nothing to do with it. I want nothing to do with it. But you know what? If someone likes that, that's their thing. As long as you yeah, don't I hurt don't other people. Game. I just will never, ever agree to look at something that involves like up and two girls again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't going to go there, but... <laughs> I mean, I'm very curious if you know what that's about, but I won't ask you that again. <laughs> no, but my, my point oh my is, God. so... Why? <laughs> my point yeah. is, though, but people people like a lot of different things, you know? So, to me, but we have to understand that, that even like animal world, there, there's a lot of uh, fish, right, that will switch gender. There's a lot of fish that will be like, or even some animals will do pseudo gender, where where they like there's some hyenas that that a female, if the male is gone, will actually take over the pride sometimes and actually grow like a pseudo penis and have sex with the females. I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. There's like there's some I think some snakes that actually 
whoever gets to the hole first, you know, the, the gender is is decided. I mean, it's there's 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 uh, animals that when it's warm, the, 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 when they're they're you know going to hatch that, that you know um, I think that that they uh, have ones that they change you know gender. This this whole idea that it's so fixed and is also we think humans. All humans, they're, once they're born, that's it. Well, that's not actually true. In fact, there's an intersex condition well, where... Actually. actually, not true. There is an intersex condition where actually you can be born. And I think it's about teenagers that these... I think the boys turn mainly to females. Uh, going to, when they go into puberty, I think it is. And it happens, I think it's in India and I think Turkey... And somewhere else, I can't remember. There's so it, it, there's some sort of a genetic probably reason, but still, my point is, it happens. I mean, somebody is a one gender, and then biologically changes to the other gender. Our system of of thinking this, you know, limit to me still goes back to that. I'm only going to accept male and female. I'm only going to accept you know heterosexual. I'm only going to accept. It's all this stuff that that's going on. It, it, but to me, it's got this religious component. That, you know, the, this religion becomes part of culture that if we don't understand it, we don't like it. And, and so it's, it's this way of controlling. And you think, what's better to make someone feel guilty all the time? Make them hate something that they, they really love. You know, make them hate, you know, not like you know, or feel bad about something that, that they enjoy doing. I mean, what better way to control people? And and sex was not something that's added just by Christians. Sex was a part of religion. Like I was saying about the kings in uh, Babylon, they would a lot of times say that they're married to be like the goddess. But who they have sex with is a whole bunch of real women that supposedly the goddess is embodying or whatever. And in fact, I think they have a, a ritual of sex to actually marry and then become the king sort of by having sex with a woman. And so, oh, it's just a bunch of crazy towns. well, yeah, and then then people, like, I I think it's, uh, yeah, and then God. Better system than we have now. <laughs> Sounds funner, but <laughs> I remember when I was a kid um, in uh, California. There was a uh, chick on the news that was had a church of the Most High Goddess, and she said everyone has to lick me, male or female, to be part of the church, and then you have sex and you give a cum offering. I was like. As a kid, I'm like, oh my god, I'm signing up for that fucking church. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? You know what I love the most in this world? Getting licked and screwed. How can I make a religion out of that happening to me? Right? Is that? <laughs> I was like, what the? Dude, I need to start a religion. <laughs> Dude, but that's like, a... <laughs> but 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 it, but it's. <laughs> but I'm saying so. I'm just making a comment that. Our concepts that you know religion and sex and a battle is nothing new. And in fact, just like people don't understand too, Africans also would cut the foreskin uh, of the penis before the Jews did it. I mean, it's not like they, they have this exclusive thing that they were the only ones that did it. And uh, but a lot of the pl places in Canaan and where the Jews, you know, Israel and stuff, basically had influence from the Egyptians. So, you know, they, they have a lot of these similar, just like how Christianity picks up paganism things, the Jews, in a sense, were picking up stuff from the people around them. And what's interesting, too, is I've heard an African explain why the female lips are cut, why the, or, or the clitoris is cut, and why that the penis foreskin is cut. What the explanation from the African, I'm not saying everyone thought this, but it gives me like an anthropological idea of maybe where this concept started. They think that, in a sense, when you go into puberty, you need to cut the male part off the female, and then you cut the foreskin on the male, you're basically cutting the female part on the male. So they think that you're turning the half male into a full male and turning the half woman into a full woman or whatever, in a sense. They're nonsense. I don't agree with this, but I'm just saying that why they do the cutting, why the genitals, to make them not you know, male or female to, you know, to make them more their actual gender or whatever. The, I just, I, I, not even as a humanist, fuck that. As a whoa. mom, <laughs> like, I, that, it doesn't matter. Even if I was in a religion, which I was, even if I was an active member all the time, like I was, if they were to say, hold your daughter down and we're going to cut this off of her, I'd be like, so mom's religion is changing and we're going to be something else. Exactly. I just want to be able 
to do that. So it, maybe I'm ignorant. I that whole FGM, and I, I really have a big problem. I, mean, I don't think you're ignorant. I think that lot. I think it's violating the the human rights of the child. I mean, I don't think yeah. that, I, I really think it's crazy how religious freedom somehow means over your child's choice. Are they not a citizen? And if you don't think they're a citizen, then how are we protecting them from child abuse? I mean, we do have anti-child abuse laws, so a parent doesn't own a child. So how exactly are the parents, you know, in a sense, religious freedom becoming the child's religious oppression? You know, it's, it's just odd. If you support religious freedom, good. Let your child choose freely. Stop forcing yeah. them. You know, yeah. I just... <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree with the Freedom from Religion Foundation. I'm a proud member. Yes, um, so am I. I went to their convention. Yes, I, I think that they do more good. When, when I try to explain to someone who has no idea, oh, what's that? I've never heard of it. Uh, mostly theists. Mostly all Americans, too. I have to explain to them you know, our constitution and the separation of church and law and that the only nonprofit group that their sole purpose is to protect that part of our constitution is, I mean, there's others, but this particular Freedom from Religion Foundation, they don't do it for a profit. They don't do it for a name. They do it because they definitely 100% would die for this protection. They, they will put their lives on the line for this protection to separate church and state because we do not want a theocracy. And it sounds hyperbolic and scary, but it's true. Religions have been known to contemporarily take over governments and rule with, you know, an iron fist. So when I tell people that, I always get, like, even if they're religious, wow, do you have it in any information? Because they were like, I'm like, well, you're Catholic, right? Right. Do you want um, Southern Baptists to take over the government? Hell no. Right. That's why we need freedom from religion. Do you want Jehovah Witnesses to take over? No. Do you want Mormons? Hell no. You know, so, right. We don't want any particular religion taking over our government. We need to take secular. I well, think that, and what, one interesting thing about religion, though, is Whenever it gets power, it only wants itself to be, in a sense, protected. And this, and, and, and also, you start getting blasphemy laws and stuff. And this includes not even just America, but even like Miramar is a, a Buddhist country. And if you make fun of Buddha, you know, you can st uh, possibly receive jail time. There was a guy that uh, in um, Miramar who had a bar and it had a Buddha drinking, and they thought that was, you know, anti-sacred. You know, they had violated this thing of what Buddha is supposed to be. And so they put him in jail. You know, and it's it's just absolute nonsense. It's like whenever a religion gets power in government, then they start oppressing people. Because then, you know, you can't accept you talking bad about what we believe.